acting CEO, and I want to welcome each and every one of you here. If you were in my 931, you get a double welcome. Um, a couple of things to know about the conference before we start, and we're a couple minutes late, but I think that's all right. Media Archives uh, is filming, or I should probably say videotaping, shows how old I am, um, each one of these sessions, and so it'll make your decisions about which panel to listen to a little easier, because later on, probably starting early Sunday, you can go and you can get a CD that has the other panel or a DVD that has the other panel on it that you missed. And in fact, the entire meeting will be available at one point or another if you want to continue your SETICON 2 experience. Um, our auction starts at about 5.30. The silent auction is on now and on all day long. So take a look. There's wonderful space memorabilia and other goodies in there that might interest you. But let's go on into our panel today. This panel is called Cosmophobia, Doomsday 2012, and Other Fiction Science. And that's not a typo. Cosmophobia is the, a word that's the invention of Dr. David Morrison, who is sitting to my right. Uh, Dr. Morrison is the head of the Carl Sagan Center for the Search for Life in the Universe at the SETI Institute. He's the former director of the NASA Lunar Science Institute. Um, he helped to found astrobiology with NASA. He's been the director of space at NASA Ames, and I always asked him, was that the space out there or deciding who got which chair? Um, and so David is, is our, one of our first panelists. The second panelist is Dr. Andrew Fracknoy, who is uh, the former director of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and very commonly associated with them. He is a board member for the SETI Institute and a professor of astronomy at Foothill College. The third person is the ever comic Seth Shostak, my colleague from the SETI Institute, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, and well known as a speaker, uh, sometimes as a comedian, and as the host of the big science radio show, which the SETI Institute under Seth Aegis uh, produces every week. And finally, we have Leonard Maldonado, who received his PhD in theoretical physics from UC Berkeley and now teaches at Caltech. He's written many articles for scientific as well as popular press and newspapers like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, although I expect most of the people on the stage have had articles in those particular rags. And um, he's done quite a bit of other work, including, and this is really fun, He's written for television series such as MacGyver and Star Trek The Next Generation. So, Cosmophobia, David, is it in the OED yet, the Oxford English Dictionary? That's what I want to know. Thank you, Edna, and welcome, everyone. I should clarify, I did not invent cosmophobia. I invented the word. It's <laughs> <laughs> the phobia is out there. And on the subject of December 2012, I am very worried about what will happen on December 21st, 2012. Not because of any uh, astronomical or external event, but because so many people, especially so many children, are afraid. They're actually afraid in their terms that I repeatedly hear of the end of the world, a concept which boggles my mind. The planet's been here for more than four billion years, and yet there are significant numbers of people that think this planet will cease to exist uh, just six months from now, which is a scary thought that they think that. Um, I have been answering questions from the public for about four years. Uh, I still in, get questions sent to NASA's, at NASA's Ask an Astrobiologist website at the rate of about 10 a day. At least once a week, I get a question from a, a young person, usually 11, 12 years old, uh, who says they are contemplating suicide before the end of the world. Uh, I know of several cases, at least reported suicides, of people who are obsessed with the end of the world in 2012. I had a conversation with a teacher, a science teacher in Stockton a month ago, who said that two of the parents of her students separately had come to her and said they were planning to kill their children and themselves uh, before the end of the world. Uh, 
perhaps equally poignantly, I got a question some time ago from a person who said, and I quote exactly, my only friend is my little dog. When should I put her to sleep so she will not suffer in the cataclysm? Um, that's the context. Uh, the context is that there are adults that are worried about it, and somehow this has been transmitted to children, and it's in that children's underground where everybody talks to everybody and, uh, and seems to think not just that there will be some bad thing happen, but that their whole life will come to an end. Uh, this is an aspect of cosmophobia because I see it in other ways, not as strongly, of whenever a new discovery is made in, in astronomy, things that I used to think was cool, like a new comet or, or something of that sort, I get questions from people whose first reaction is, will it kill me? Uh, for instance, you may have all read a few weeks ago about a new determination that the Andromeda galaxy was going to collide with our own galaxy <laughs> in four billion years. And I keep getting questions. What can I tell my children? My children are so scared. How can it be that the world is going to end because of the Andromeda galaxy four billion years from now? Uh, I've heard some people have written to me saying they can't sleep because of Betelgeuse. They lie there at night worrying about Betelgeuse. And you can go on with this. But the big issue for now is, is December 21st, 2012. Uh, a rumor without any core, any core facts. Uh, I compare it sometimes with the, uh, the Y2K. A lot of people got scared about Y2K, but at least there was a core thing that was true that a lot of computers had to be reprogrammed and new software written to handle the turnover uh, at the new millennium. In this case, it's manufactured out of nothing out of a psychic who says that she is receiving messages from aliens around the star Zeta Reticuli about a supposed turnover in the Mayan calendar, which isn't even there, about a planet alignment, when if you look at any of the standard programs that show you uh, the, the sky, you will see the planets are not aligned at all on December 21st. Or there's the one about there's going to be an alignment between the Earth, the Sun, and the center of our galaxy. And, uh, of course, <laughs> that's quite true. It happens every December. Uh, but somehow there is this focus on 2012. Uh, we'll come back to it. There's a lot more details. I would like to introduce Bill Hudson in the audience, if he will stand up, because he has probably the best reference, and that is the 2012, uh, 2012 hoax. Uh, website and and we all owe him and his colleagues a debt of gratitude for having put out on the web something that anybody can go to. Um, the <laughs> the problem, of course, and I'll just use this to conclude my introductory remarks, is that we are completely drowned out by the doomsdayers on the internet. The people who believe these things are getting all of their information from the internet. It's not appearing on any of the regular uh, news or, or publications. They're getting it from, from YouTube videos. And there are so many out there. There are, for instance, more than 300 books published on Doomsday 2012 uh, in, uh, listed in Amazon.com uh, that, that it's very hard for the truth to even get a hearing when we are drowned out by thousands of websites and thousands of YouTube videos that claim the world is about to end, and I think that's scary. <coughs> Shall I? All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to the last ever SETICON. <laughs> um, and I, I'd like to take a minute to broaden the discussion from the wonderful place that David began it. Um, I think we're seeing quite a sea change in how some of these issues are perceived by the public. And the way I like to put it, because I'm a boring academic, is that we don't have referees anymore. Uh, in science, whenever you write a paper or have an idea, it gets refereed by your colleagues. So if it's totally crazy, someone writes you a letter and says, you know what, it's totally crazy. 
And our culture had some built-in referees for a long time. Uh, these included, believe it or not, I know it seems crazy now, publishers who took their job very seriously about what they should and shouldn't publish, the mainstream media, uh, librarians, teachers, um, a, a wide range of professionals whose job it was to sort out sense from nonsense. Today, it seems like money is much more important than truth, that, pe that anything goes, places like the History Channel, and I was appalled to see one of my favorites, the National Geographic Channel, are putting on so-called documentaries about this 2012 nonsense. So fear-mongering has become a large and profitable industry. And scientists, academics, who really know the story, they're often too busy, too underpaid, or too surprised to do anything about this. Many of my academic colleagues can't believe that there's this much public interest and fear. And then they get reminded in their classrooms, and they still try to stick their heads in the proverbial sand. So I worry, who's going to set the public straight? Because it isn't just what's going to happen at 2012 winter solstice that's at stake here. Let me remind you of some of the other astronomically and SETI-connected nonsense ideas that are out there. There's astrology, that where the planets and uh, sun and moon were at the moment of your birth is going to affect your destiny. There's the topic of UFOs, that alien spacecraft are coming here, kidnapping two drunken fishermen in Mississippi and going home. Um, <laughs> there's the notion of a face on Mars as a message from an ancient civilization. The idea that ancient astronauts had to help us start civilization because we were too stupid to do it ourselves. Um, the idea that the universe is only 6,000 years old. And then the one that gets astronomers most crazy, that we never landed on the moon, that the entire moon landing was filmed in a Hollywood studio, and it's a vast conspiracy, even though now our spacecraft are showing the tracks that the astronauts left on the moon. It's still a vast conspiracy. So I, in a way, I'm here to enlist you in the good fight for rationality. Uh, those of you intelligent enough to come to SETICON are obviously among the most intelligent people in the universe. <laughs> and flattery will get me everywhere. And uh, we encourage you to do more to help stem this incredible tide of irrational thinking. Each of you has received a little green sheet that I made up which has more resources on it. Um, it's got websites and books and things you can read. And we encourage you to get involved in, in a sense, setting the record for science straight. Well, uh, I'm sort of disappointed that David is beat up on the Mayans, uh, because after all, you know, you figure there have been a trillion days since the formation of the Earth, and the Mayans managed to get that one day right. So I'm going to talk to the Mayans about going with me to Las Vegas. I, I, by the way, I'm, and, and I wasn't paying my estimated taxes until you uh, told me that it probably isn't true, David. Uh, let, me just, let me just say a few things about um, things other than the Mayan prophecy about the end of the universe. I think very few of you believe that that's going to happen. But many people actually believe that we're uh, doomed in some ways to do ourselves in. And I'd like to address that, because I, you know, call me Pollyanna, but I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, there are problems, for example, I mean, obviously, growing population, although they say it's going to stabilize by 2050 at some number of around 10, 12 billion, okay, but, I mean, uh, you know, 40 years ago, they were saying it was hyper-exponential and it wasn't going to stabilize, so I, I don't take these predictions terribly uh, seriously, but there are things that are going wrong. Obviously, we run out of fossil fuels and things like that. There's a solution to that, by the way, an obvious solution that's been kicked around for at least three decades, and that is to put up power sets. Right? Stop trying to make energy by burning stuff and shuffling <coughs> electrons around here on the Earth. Shuffle them around in power sets, which are just big solar panels in orbit, right? So they collect as much energy as you need and then beam it back to the Earth in low-density microwaves. And you can do that without cooking a whole lot of birds. And if you do cook birds, I mean, maybe you could put rye toast underneath and, you know, 
it's, it's possible. Anyhow, the only thing that's stopping this, the idea is a good one, and the only thing that's, there are no emissions, right? You don't burn anything, no CO2, nothing, nothing. Uh, and you can get as much energy as you can afford to put up power sats for. The, the sun puts out, uh, what, 10 to the 26 watts, and, you know, humans use 10 to the 13, so that's, you know, 10 trillion times as much energy as you need. Uh, the only thing that's stopping us are the costs, of course, and that's an economic thing, but at some point that cost equation will flip over. But maybe worse than that are the, the facts that we're running out of some important things, like uh, copper and zinc. The time scales for copper and zinc becoming so expensive that you'll have to, you know, you'll, people, you'll have to defend your home so that people don't come in and strip all the copper pipes out of it, right? They're probably doing that already in some, some uh, areas around here. Or, or platinum. Platinum, you think, oh, platinum's not big in my life. I mean, I got a ring and that's it. But it is big in your life because, for example, the catalytic converters and all that, that's platinum. And in fact, there's, there's some woman in the UK who has devised some equipment that allows her to troll the highways of England trying to recover the platinum. But we run out of that stuff. And for some of these things, there, there are replacements. You can engineer some sort of replacements. For some other elements, maybe you can't. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a more serious problem. Uh, I'm, I remain optimistic we'll be able to do something about that. There are some limits, by the way. I, I mentioned that you, there's no limit on the amount of energy you can get, but there is a limit on the amount of energy you can use, right? You can beam down all that free, emission-free energy from space, but what are you doing with it? You know, you're running machinery, you're running your car, you're running your Wii, whatever you're running, okay, and that essentially all of it gets turned into heat. And once you produce enough heat, to increase the, the, uh, the amount of heat, the energy approaches, say, 0.1 to 1% of the solar insulation, which is the amount of uh, solar energy falling on the Earth, which is like 10 to the 17 watts. Once you get up to a tenth of percent of that or 1% of that, and we're within a few orders of magnitude of that right now, by the way, uh, then you change the climate of the Earth in ways that are probably irreparable. So there is a limit. There actually is a limit. But fortunately, there's a fix for this, too. And it was actually promulgated in the 1970s by people like Jerry O'Neill at Princeton and, and Tom Heppenheimer, who was at Caltech at the time, I believe. And he, you may remember these books, right? They said, look, the answer is put everybody in rotating aluminum cans in space, hey, space, right? Okay, and you might say, well, I don't want to live in a rotating aluminum can, but think of it, no mosquitoes, no snakes. And you can see your neighbors up there, it rotates once a minute, so you have one G of gravity on the inside, you have a farm nearby and so forth. You might, you might begin to pity the people down on Earth. And the big advantage of all this is, aside from the fact that unlimited, unlimited real estate, right, you take resources from the moon, you just sort of, you know, throw them off the moon, the gravity's low enough that you can sort of do that, okay. The big advantage is there, there's no limit to this, and we will have dispersed homo sapiens. We might be able to do ourselves in, we might be able to cause doomsday. I think it's very difficult, but we could probably, if you wanted to make a national project out of it, maybe you could do it, okay. <laughs> But once you're dispersed, you can't do it. I mean, I can get rid of the ants in my kitchen with difficulty, but I can't get rid of all ants because they're dispersed. So you can imagine 100 years from now, you're sitting in a colony on Mars, right? You pick up the paper. Well, nobody does that. You open your browser, and it says, Earth destroyed by nuclear war or something like that. And then, you know, you can see, well, Mars, that's too bad. There goes the export market. But humans have, <laughs> but humans have not gone away. Right. So I think that we have this bottleneck that we have to get through in the next century or two, and if we can survive that, we can si survive forever. And the final thing I'll say, just a caveat about that, because I think the big unknown in all this is none of, any of these things that I've talked about, but it's the development of artificial intelligence. Some of you have heard me talk about that sort of thing before, and that may come within 50 or 100 years. And once we have machines on this planet that can do a lot better at cogitating than we can, uh, I think that opens up possibilities that are difficult for us to see we're not smart enough. Hi. I'd just like to add one uh, uh, different perspective to, uh, to the uh, ruminations on these doomsday ideas and how people can be so irrational and, and believe something uh, crazy like uh, uh, a woman with a, uh, some kind of technology implanted in her brain is getting signals from outer space and uh, predicting the end of the Earth and and that is that, that I think this is uh, actually uh, both from the point of view of the people who say such things and the people who believe them. It's I think it's a very natural human um, uh, um, uh, uh, phenomenon, and it's something that's always gone on and it's going to continue to go on. And that we call these people extremely irrational, but I think that if you think about it in a, in a broader sense, people who we consider very rational believe such things 
all the time. Uh, there are, for instance, of course, uh, religions that we call cults, like uh, Scientology, that, that have stories that seem unbelievable, that have huge followings. And we tend to deride those, those cults or those religions. But if you go back a little further in history, there are, I think, equally uh, strange uh, stories that are believed about, for instance, uh, a guy who could, I think, turn um, blood into water or and walk on water. Uh, there's one guy uh, that's in my culture who went up on a mountain and came back, talked to God, and came back with some laws that we're all supposed to follow. And, and I think the main difference between some of these uh, predictions, cults, stories, and the ones that happen today is that they are the ones that survived. Uh, you know, there, there was once a prodigy, uh, uh, which was a, a email service, right? And, and then there was AOL, and now there's Gmail. And, you know, through time, the other ones uh, die off, and no one remembers prodigy, and, uh, and, and they were probably, therefore, um, not worthy. And the ones that stick around, we tend to worship, and I think the same thing happens with these stories. So. The, 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 the strange stories of, uh, of uh, supernatural things happening uh, that have survived for 2,000 years that were, you know, like lucky enough to get in at the beginning and, and, uh, and get a good market share before the, the, the new ones came along. Uh, they, they, they are now not considered crazy and people can be very rational and believe those stories. And uh, the ones that are, let's say, more modern, haven't ha survived the test of time are considered a little bit weird. So I have a different perspective. I don't consider those people particularly weird. I just think that they're um, early adopters, you might call them. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're taking a chance and by investing in these ideas that haven't uh, survived yet and may not survive. And uh, so anyway, that's my perspective on it. All right, and I'm going to offer the panelists the opportunity to comment upon each of their mini lectures here. Um, David, you look yes, put your hand I, up first. I, I have a comment uh, particularly addressed to Andy uh, because I think he's absolutely right. We, we don't seem to have or respect the referees. And this is something our society has done to itself, and so we have to look to the solution. The internet was supposed to be the answer to everything. There's all this information at your fingertips, and it's there. There's vast amounts of great data and information, and there are vast amounts of crap. And, uh, and especially with young people, they simply do not know how to tell the difference. Uh, at the best, they will just count numbers. Well, here are 83 websites that say the world will end in 2012, and one that says it won't, so it must be true. <laughs> And I think that uh, if there's ever a lesson that we should try to figure out how to teach ourselves and our children, it's how to distinguish truth from fiction. I, I am a professor I know at the University of Colorado actually does that with his students. He assigns them pairs of websites, uh, you know, one, one that's good and one that's bad, and asks them to go out and come back and report to the class how they can tell the difference how they can decide which one is reliable and which is not. Because we are so overloaded, so flooded with information and misinformation, it's a real problem. Can you respond to that, Andy? Well, uh, in some sense, I think the, the answer is education. But I also think that in some sense, it's almost a question of industry standards. I think there, here in Silicon Valley, we are, we are in the center of this revolution, and nobody is much going after the issue of how do we make this better. I think Wikipedia does try. I, I applaud Wikipedia for some of the things that they try to do in the way that they uh, ha interact, almost like a journal interacts. But it is a difficult problem. I wanted to mention a Reuters poll that came out uh, last month um, I'm just learning about this, but apparently, according to this Reuters poll, they did a study of 16,000 people in a wide range of countries around the world. 10% um, of the world population now believes the world will end in 2012. And even worse, 15% of the world population believes that the world will end before they die. Uh, in the U.S., that number is 22 percent. 22 percent of the U.S. population responded to a Reuters poll 
saying that they believe the world will come to an end before it's their time to have their natural span on earth end. Uh, and that's a thought-provoking idea of how powerful these crazy notions have become. I, I recommend that if, if you can find that one of your neighbors is among these 10% or whatever it is, you do what Phil Plate does, offer them $10,000 for their house, <laughs> and if the world doesn't end, you get the house. <laughs> that stopped the conversation. <laughs> Leonard, are you in the real estate market down there? <laughs> Uh, I, I wouldn't take that deal, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, cosmophobia is this incredible fear of the unknown and, and doomsday and what's going to happen to us, and we're in almost a culture clash between the quiet, rational voice of science, which I think people here on the stage represent, and a mania that comes at us from all kinds of directions. And what I'd like to do now is open up to you, all about 265 or 70 of you, I think, and find out if you have some questions for our panelists. We're going to have a couple of microphones running around. I'll ask you to please put the microphone next to your face so the rest of us can hear you. And so your question is also recorded for the DVDs and the tapes. And I'm going to give both these mics to Alex, who will be running around handing them out. And while he's searching, please. If any of you knows how to convince an 11-year-old child that the world will not end and she shouldn't commit suicide, tell us, because that's a real problem. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, you were talking about an overload of information. I'm sorry. You're talking about an overload of information is, is somehow causing so much confusion and people grasping at something. But I think if I remember back in the 1880s, the Millerites were selling their homes because some sect, this is pre-internet, right? And they called it, after it didn't happen, they called it the Great Disappointment. So this is not really that a new of a phenomenon. Well, my, 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 bigger, my bigger point was that culture, if religion is, a, is a, a product of culture, and that if science is influencing, trying to influence, I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big task, is it possible that science could possibly modify religious views, or would this take a, a gigantic event in deep space to do it? I mean, is it, is it, is it, or is it is a long track to get to some more, if we're talking about a more rational way of looking at, at existence? Well, I think, sci first of all, I, I, I think I would take exception to saying that science is trying to affect culture. Um, I suppose some scientists are by, because I, people like me think that it's important for people to understand science, but fundamentally science is a search for knowledge, and it's not, it's not part of science to convince other people uh, or to affect the culture. That's uh, a, a slightly different enterprise, I think. Um, and now I forgot the other thing I was going to say. What was the end of what you said about the... Um, Oh, right, right. So, so I think science has already affected religion a, a great deal. Uh, I think the Pope uh, has recognized evolution, right? And I think even, even the, the Big Bang Theory, um, although when I wrote the book with Stephen Hawking, The Grand Design, the, the Vatican issued a statement that scientists shouldn't talk about the beginning of the universe. But, um, but I think science has, you know, definitely affected uh, organized religion and the doctrines that they, that they you know, promulgate. Um, the bigger question or issue, I suppose, it has to do with the pe people who follow a religion and, and, and maybe uh, take, take the teachings of the religion and, and try to apply them to, um, to what should be scientific questions, to the questions of the nature of the universe, and then don't believe the results of science. Um, you know, I think, I think organized religion has come a, a long way f uh, from pre-scientific times to recognizing the story of science and somehow in parallel with the story of the Bible. But I think that um, a lot of the followers of religion uh, mix up the, you know, the two realms. And I, I think it's fine and good to have a spiritual side. And to, you know, uh, if you follow a religion because you have a, a certain intuition or feeling that there's a higher power, that's you know, I think probably a good thing, and it gives people strength uh, if that's the way they feel. 
but the problem comes when you um, apply that specifically to our everyday world and, uh, and then uh, oppose some of the um, knowledge that we get from science or refuse to apply it, for instance, to take medicines or for what, you know, and other things that people do. So um, I think that's uh, really where the danger lies and where uh, we have to find a way to educate people better. Thank you. I, I, can, can I just say something yeah, yeah, about uh, the, the idea that it's the tools that are responsible for the belief in a lot of the pseudoscience, yeah. right? I think that's somewhat misplaced. To, to say that because of the internet and it's unpoliced, well, I, I don't know how many of you think that the internet ought to be policed. I suspect that it's a minority. I, I'm not so sure. I, I don't think I'd want it policed. And I don't think that's the problem, actually. It isn't the tools. It isn't the tools. It's the psychology of belief in things. Polls since the 1960s have shown what fraction of the population believes that the aliens are visiting the Earth. And that's one third. And that's been one third in this country and virtually every other first world country since the 1960s. That hasn't changed. Even though the method in which we distribute information has changed enormously, right? So that suggests that, this is, that the problem isn't the internet or, or, or how anybody can put something on the internet. This is psychology. And I think part of it, if you have to ask, why do you believe that or something like that? Because at least to some extent, it's a very empowering thought that you know something very important that those nerdy, pointy-headed, tweed-jacketed academics down at the local university won't acknowledge and don't know. And, you know, I think you have to look for the, the answers there. Thanks, Seth. Okay, Lourdes. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm from Mexico City, and I have been doing some astronomy outreach and translation of astronomy articles into Spanish, and have been uh, collaborating with uh, Bill Hudson to translate some of the information to the 2012 hoax into Spanish. And uh, then one day, my 10-year-old daughter was watching TV, and she saw this commercial about, oh, the last cruise of your life next uh, December, the last December on your life. So my own daughter was frightened and having nightmares, uh, thinking about this, the last uh, year of her life. And I have a tough time convincing her that she has no reason to be worried, but was because of a uh, commercial that she uh, watched on TV, and the quiet um, voice of reason doesn't get on the media. It's not just on the internet, it's on uh, the media that we are having this uh, misinformation. So my question is how we can get this voice of reason into the media so we can beat them on the ground. Who wants to respond to that? How are we going to change the media? It won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> or I think, what, I think you, you point an, to an interesting question, but I, I want to use your question in a slightly different way and emphasize what David said earlier, because I think it's a really important point. Uh, David and I both do quite a bit of education. We try to work with the media, not that Seth doesn't, um, but <laughs> it's clear to, to, to the sort of observer of the media and of the public that it used to be that when there was an astronomical discovery, that was a source of pleasure for people, not fear. You discovered that there was a giant black hole with 10 billion times the mass of the sun, which is what we've discovered most recently, and it's great. Or you discovered that there's a black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. People didn't go around hiding in closets. They thought about how exciting science was. And now somehow the media and the, just the times and the financial meltdown and everything else that's been happening have helped to make these discoveries a source of fear rather than of pleasure. And if there's a role for scientists, it seems to me it's getting back to the joy of those discoveries and getting away from the threatening sense of them or the fear of them. Yeah, but I, I think that one, one thing that makes that hard is that uh, scientists who try to explain science to the public, we're, we're usually preaching to the converted. Like, uh, how many of you here believe the Earth is going to end in December and are going now that you're hearing us going, wow, it, I'm going to live next year. Probably you all came here already with your minds made up. And, and I find that that's uh, one of the frustrating things. I, I, I've, I remember um, I've been on on this show called Coast to Coast uh, four or five times. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess you guys know that. You're insomniacs, huh? So it, it's 11 p.m. till uh, 2 a.m. here, and then, it's, of course, it's live, so it's three hours later on the East Coast. So especially toward the end, you get all kinds of interesting calls. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I've been on, you know, for each of my books, and uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, when you're NPR, you feel like you're getting the word out, and when you're on coast to coast, you also feel like you're getting the word out, but then when people call in, you realize that, you know, it's really clear that you haven't convinced anybody. Um, after I, I uh, wrote The Drunkard's Walk, which is about randomness in, your, in life, uh, I had a caller who called in and said, you know, every time I, I get out on the street, I can see the future. I know what's going to happen two minutes, five minutes, an hour from now. So how can there be randomness in life when I know exactly what's going to happen? You know, how do you answer that? There, there are people out there who, who, you know, they have a certain set of beliefs, and you can, you can, you can they even listen to a show, and they can hear you talk for hours, and at the end, they still ask a question like that. So I think the, the bigger issue isn't so, as much how do we get the word out and how do we explain what we're doing. That's, that's an important issue. It's how do you explain what you're doing to lay people? But also, how can you start to reach people who don't believe you and who you have a hard time convincing? Next question. Uh, yes, I have a uh, question for the panel. I'm wondering if any of you recall when the world ended in, I believe it was either 77 or 1980, due to the uh, Jupiter effect, and how that, how that phenomenon compares to uh, this December uh, 2012 end of the world scenario. No, I don't. But you know, there have been, been uh, things, there have been end of the world predictions every few years throughout history, really. And, uh, and we had uh, two or three last year. Comet Elenin was going to cause the end of the world in September. There was going to be the rapture, and all the good people were going to be disappearing suddenly. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things happening. I do not think they are as pervasive as what Andy reported, where, where 10 or 15 percent of the people specifically think the end of the world's coming this December. That seems to me to be qualitatively or quantitatively different. Oh, so I'm sorry. I was going to say that the, you're talking about the book by John Gribben and others about the lineup of the planets. And some of that has survived in the sense that there are claims that in 2012, the planets are going to line up. The planets were not lined up. I think it was 81, right, Seth, that this, this happened? That I, the I book was, the year. Yeah, it was the early 80s. And there was a wide triangle of the planets distributed around the sun, nothing like a lineup. And you're all here, those of you who were alive in 1981, so that's pretty good evidence <laughs> that the world didn't end. But I think that was a much more single phenomenon, end of the world. What I see is interesting about 2012 is that every single weird kind of thing that you could put into the pot has been put into the pot, in part so that the books could distinguish themselves. I'm going to write a book about the end of the world from the galactic alignment. I'm going to write a book, a book about the end of the world from the dangerous planet that only the Babylonians knew about or the Sumerians knew about. So uh, there's a, an enormous number of things being stirred into this crazy pot this time around. I, I think that that book may have ended John Gribben's career as a, a popular writer. I, I don't remember anything after that. Do oh, you? no, he's written lots of books. Oh, yeah, but were they successful? I, I don't hear about it anymore. You know, yeah, the, the, you, 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 uh, you know, the planets are probably never never aligned in the history of the solar system in, in, you know, in any very accurate way. But work it out. Work out, the, uh, for example, the tidal force on your own body if all the planets were to align and decide whether that force, that, 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 that differential force from your head to your toe, whatever, is, is greater than the uh, tidal effect of the Hilton Hotel across the street. I bet it's, I bet it's not. Okay, That's a next hard question. one to follow. Oh, I oh, was going to add one thing. There have been many doomsday scenarios through history, and there was a famous one in the 1950s. Uh, um, you have to, my mind is a sieve, so I don't really remember the... Um, the details, but a, there was a famous psychological study of the people who believed that. So a psychologist studied the people who believed in that, and they were getting ready for the end of the world, just as they are now, and also studied their, and interviewed them after it didn't happen. And um, I guess they gave permission for that, because they figured it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but but um, they were around, and they interviewed them. And what's interesting is that a large number of them didn't uh, believe that they were wrong, 
uh, they believed that their calculations were somehow off, or they found other reasons, excuses, so to speak, for, um, f for the reason that it didn't happen. And this psychological analysis concluded that, that these people had a hard time accepting that, it, that, that, that what they believed wasn't going to happen, and so they kind of worked backwards from the event that it didn't happen and found reasons to explain why they were wrong. So this just shows you uh, how um, you know, tenacious these ideas are in people's heads and how hard it is to um, talk people out of them. Because even when they see that the world didn't end, they still believe their premise. They just think they got the details wrong. And then they did, because the world will eventually end. So, Not for a while. <laughs> A uh, gentleman in the back. <laughs> yeah, the, you. You had your arm waving uh, thank, for ages. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Leonard Mladenov uh, mentioned earlier that uh, he, uh, that, 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 uh, um, oh, I've geezed on the point, but, uh, <laughs> my, but the question I wanted to ask is that um, there is a distinction made, it seems, by scientists between um, sort of easy targets, which are like these uh, 2012 predictions, you know, sort of the early adopters of uh, Mladenov, and the well-established sort of denatured religions uh, because they're felt to be less threatening. And there's in this bargain made by a lot of scientists that you will, that we will, uh, you know, we will not, we will we'll say there's nothing, you know, there's nothing, science and religion are completely separate things, and we don't have to fight with religion. But they're, ter they're talking about the sort of the sort of large market share religions who they regard as non-threatening, but um, I mean I think that that is a dangerous thing to do because um, it, you know the 2012 thing will pass and these smaller things will pass and they may you know cause a little damage, but there are huge issues that such as global warming, such as how we relate to the world, such as how we relate to other religions that are that are far more impactful for the evolution of society and the future society, and they are critically dependent on, the, on large numbers of people who, who make assumptions and make, make decisions based on the large market share religion. So I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between, uh, between those two categories of sort of irrational beliefs. Uh, and the comment about uh, uh, was that uh, Leonard Mladenov said that science is about the search for knowledge, but I think to, to zero authority could argue that science is about the search for funding. So, okay, that was a nice long sort of question. Uh, rather than getting too delayed into religion, I want to point out that at 4:15 this afternoon we have a panel called Do, "Does the Big Bang Require a Divine Spark?" and it will certainly address some of these issues. And so I'd like to defer that. Let's get some of the other kind of questions that are back more focused on this panel. Um, there's a gentleman in the middle there with a mic. Yeah, I think this is very interesting. Um, and I kind of debate how much to really think about it. But uh, now I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old child, and I start thinking about the next generation and what they're going to inherit. And I always, you always kind of assume these, these crazy ideas are going to die off. But I'm here from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I want to bring you a report from the Creation Museum that was just uh, you know, opened a few years ago there. This is a $20 million state-of-the-art museum, completely paid for in cash. They've got it paid. And I, I, I decided to drop the 30 bucks to spend the day there, and I saw the two planetarium shows. And I was wondering if like half the people there would be snickering and, you know, <laughs> look at that. And they weren't. I mean, every single person there was with the program. And I'm watching the families walk in with the young children. I'm watching the busloads pulling up. And it really kind of bothered me at a fundamental level that uh, you can't underestimate how powerful the forces are that are trying to train a whole new generation of people to think irrationally. So I just didn't know if you wanted to comment on that uh, transgenerational. You always just kind of assume things are going to get better, but there's actually very powerful forces that are, could be making it worse. Any comments, gentlemen? Uh, to, to, to some extent, I think you're the victim of a selection effect. When you look around the museum and you say they're with the program, yes, but maybe that's because that's the reason that they're there. So there's that. I, I, I think you really do need to step back and look at the historical perspective. That's been brought up several times here 
and ask yourself, are things better than they were 100 years ago? And, and I think that they are. I honestly do think that they are. There was an, an enormous amount of irrational belief 100 years ago, and if we go back 1,000 years ago, uh, even more. In fact, irrational belief was the only belief, okay? So, you know, to say that this is, this is some sort of problem that without precedent uh, is, I think, wrong. It isn't to gainsay that we have to address all these things, but, you know, I went to a skeptics conference uh, in New York a couple of weeks ago, and people got up and they, they, they attacked all these things that you're talking about. That was great, and it was, it was very informative and, and modestly amusing, too. But the audience was the choir, which is really the wrong analog, isn't it? But the audience was the... <laughs> The audience was the choir, and, and that's the problem with the skeptics uh, movement. You're, you're talking to people who already believe what you're saying, and, and Leonard's right. You talk uh, to George Norrie late at night, and you find out what, you know, at least what the truckers think on the East Coast. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, Andy I, wants to say something. I, I, I want to take a slightly different tack on, 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 you, on both these questions, because both questioners have essentially raised the same issue, which is what do we do about the rise of irrational thinking, uh, and particularly when it comes to affecting not little issues like whether we landed on the moon or not, but really bigger issues such as global warming and the, the notion that, that, that somehow evolution is an evil theory rather than a marvelous frame for how the universe developed. Um, I think there the, the biggest hope and the biggest effort needs to be put into education. The reason they built that museum and the reason you see kids going there is because they know the power of getting to kids early with those ideas. I can't tell you here in Silicon Valley how many of my introductory astronomy students have a lot of training already in creationist ideas through their churches, through their families, through their... They don't know that there is a Christian perspective which is more broad-minded than the creationist perspective, because they often get that. So there is an enormous role for education. I think one of the biggest things that we need to do is to support the teaching of good science in all our schools. One of the most unintended but difficult effects of No Child Left Behind was that because they only tested subjects like reading and math, the other subjects have tended to atrophy. So in a funny way, we need to advocate for an equal share for science and for better training for science people, uh, science teachers nationwide as a way of having a different set of informations and truths and facts put before those kids while their minds are open. I think education is the key. I think we have time for one more question. Oh no, she has a question up here. Ah. But the gentleman back there has the mic. You can talk to him afterwards. It'll be great. Yes. <laughs> so I want to pick up on the we thread do. of uh, rationalism that we've been talking about in the last couple of questions. Get um, this lady <clears> the mic. A little louder. Uh, 500 years ago, this would never have been a problem because the main idea in the West was that we uh, were very important. We human beings were very important. The universe centered on us. We had the rainbow in the sky to reassure us that the world was not going to be destroyed because we had a promise from the big, the big uh, man on top. But in the last 500 years, that's kind of been dethroned, and people realize that really we're very small and insignificant. I have a hunch this is why kids are especially worried about this, because they know they're small and insignificant, and the idea that something big, scary, and unknown from way far away that's completely overpowering could get them is not irrational at all. So I think that we are in a position of that as a species and that our certainty that there is no monster under the bed has been taken away because the authorities, those referees you were talking about that we used to trust, have in some ways either been compromised or delegitimated. So we look around and if the scientific response is, well, actually, it's not that we're special, it's just that we're very, very small and hard to hit. <laughs> uh, I can see how this is not completely an unreasonable approach to search for any kind of certainty or suggestion that there is something knowable about the universe. And if the scientific answer is, well, the universe is very knowable, but you've got to be really smart and work at it for a really, really long time, I can also see how that's not exactly comforting to, uh, to most people. So my question really is, what kind of story can we tell that's neither we're too small to be worried about, nor we're the king of creation, 
that will give people some kind of emotional comfort that will lead them to them maybe taking a deep breath, maybe looking, maybe spending some of the time to come up with the actual answers. Thank you. Also, I think that you were looking at, you're referring to uh, when prophecy failed, uh, about the uh, end of, a collapse of a, of a end of time movement in the 40s. And it's got a, a big uh, point in there about how some of the people, after the prophecies didn't come true, they left. Others were so invested in the social gets that they got out of the community, or the psychological validation they got out of the community, that they couldn't let it go. And it dwindled down, but I believe that from that group from the 40s, there's still some who are true believers who are still around because they were so personally invested in that being the truth that they never got out even when, you know, six years later, it didn't happen. Thank you. I, I, think, I think that's a very interesting comment and because it reflects something that I get in questions in the public. There are many people who think that we've found life on lots of other worlds, that people could live on other worlds, that if something bad happens here, uh, they can be transferred to, to some one of the Kepler planets. Uh, and I mean, it's it's simple fact that much as we would love to be detecting other other signals from other civilizations or finding life in other planets, and I believe we will. Right now, we've only got one planet, the Earth. That's it. There's no place else to go, and we better take good care of it, and maybe that will give a little more value to, uh, to our existence here. Okay, David told me we had a little more time. Our watches were out of sync. Yes, ma'am. You were eager yeah. to ask yes. your question, so uh, let's have a question. I'll try not to be wordy. Um, as an educator, I'm, a te I'm an English teacher, and you guys were saying that uh, for some reason students don't, have, don't know how to differentiate the crap from the quality and it's, in my opinion, it's because in science, in history, and in other, um, in other classes on campus, they don't teach the kids how to break things down. They say that that falls on us, the English teachers. We're the ones that are supposed to teach them how to analyze, but the problem is we're English, so the only thing I really know how to teach them is how to analyze fiction. So unless English teachers, like me, decide to come to things like you know, the SETI convention, what are we gonna do? So my question to you is, considering that's the way it is, um, where it falls on the English teacher to teach the students how to read science and nonfiction and differentiate garbage from quality, um, gosh, wh like what's the first thing that I should do? I mean, gosh, I'd, I'm, I'm a Hemingway and Bronte person, I don't, <laughs> you know, I mean like, where do we start, or should we, or should we tell the science teachers, hey, do your goddamn job, yeah. you know, so, yes. <laughs> what do we do? I, I, I just want to, I know, Andy, you want to say something, I just want to briefly say that, that, <laughs> sorry, that, okay, I just wanted to, to, before you, I just wanted to briefly say that uh, You've got, it, you've got it right, and I think that, you know, it came up a little earlier how science is taught, in the, and, and also math in this country, and it really stinks. And uh, I know from my own kids and seeing other kids that they have a, a natural, when they're young, love and curiosity, quite often for math and for science, that's totally systematically beaten out of them as they go to school, and they, you know, they learn science by memorizing different facts, they learn math by uh, taking an equation, and, and you know, Iterate, uh, do, doing 25, 30, 50 different exercises where they're uh, solving the same thing to, uh, to, to uh, get practiced at it. And what they should be teaching instead is just what you say, because science is, science is about curiosity and skepticism and how you get at the truth. And, and if science classes were more uh, based on the fun in science, about uh, you know, understanding things, being curious and being skeptical, and, and how, how do you attack uh, uh, how do you attack a problem, and how do you how do you read someone's theory, and how do you you know um, how do you tear it apart? Really, uh, th then then this wouldn't be a problem. And I and I agree with you that it should be in the in the science teacher science classrooms where they learn that. So uh, I want to echo that in a way and answer the last two questions in a quick way. So I think that there are ways that we can use our science classes, and there are good science teachers doing this, and many of us, Edna, for example, are, are involved in training science teachers to do a better job. That's part of the role of the SETI Institute, and we hope that you'll investigate some of the great science education programs that we have at the Institute. But here are two things that I train my students to do. Number one, whenever you hear something like a science fact, Ask yourself the question, why should I believe a word of this? 
And if you know how to answer, why should I believe a word of this, then you're much closer to scientific truth. Not just what are the results, but how do we get there? And so much of science is about memorizing results rather than asking, how do we get there? The other thing that I try to do with my classes and goes back to the question of telling stories, so often we get lost in the details and we miss out on the great story of science in the 21st century. I disagree with you, sir, that the only alternatives are the ancient myth of we are the center of the universe or that we're so small we can just hide. No, I think there's an enormously ennobling story in modern science today, how we have evolved from the universe, how our <coughs> minds are greater than our physical size, how we've managed to get the grand design of the universe. That's something that ennobles us in a way that the ancients never thought of. And teaching that story of science is something we should do much more often. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> I want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank you for being here today. And all of these fellows are going to be here. You can corner them and pepper them with the rest of your questions or come back to another panel that they'll be on because they will all be reappearing later in the day. For those of you who have lunch tickets today for the um, Lunch with a Scientist, it's across the lobby and up the escalator to the Santa Clara Ballroom. Thank you very much. Is this the first time you've done this? Yeah. yeah. yeah.